Welcome and thank you for checking out our service. Make sure to visit our website, sardiniacc.com, or download our church app to stay up to date and connected with everything going on here at SCC. And no matter where you're tuning in from today, we hope that this message encourages you and challenges you to follow Jesus and make disciples. God bless, and we hope to see you soon at one of our live in-person worship gatherings on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. As some of you may have noticed this past week, and if you didn't, I'll be very surprised, but we had our very first snow this season. For some of you, maybe you got a, a little bit more than other of us. Some of us just got a little bit, but it was just so exciting to be able to see that ver very first few flakes of snow. Even, even if it's not a whole lot, it's, it's just wonderful to see that at least for the first time in the season. And this year, it just feels a little bit more exciting because I have my, my son with me, and I and he's over a year old now, and I just want to be able to take him out there and just bundle him up to the point where he can't even move his mouth probably and just, you know, let him be able to just experience that snow for the first time, getting to feel it, see it, smell it, maybe taste it. We'll see. But it's just, just such a wonderful thing because for him, it is just a new thing for him just to be able to see that for the very first time. And as we come together every week, it is, it is that same type of thing. We get to come together. For, it's, it's like we're coming to, to God for the first time and getting to experience um, his love again and for the very first time. And for a lot of us as Christians, you know, we, we met him and came to know him a long time ago, possibly some, some maybe more recent, but we get to experience like it's that first love again. And if you do not know him yet, let me just tell you, it is a wonderful time and you are in for a treat. So let's go ahead and go to communion, go to prayer today as we get ready for communion. And if you are, and also if you are new with us, uh, we do have communion um, stations set up at uh, each corner of the room. So just go over to the one that is closest to you here in a moment after we get done praying. And if you're worshiping with us from home today, go ahead and just take a moment and use whatever you have at home, crackers and juice, and uh, join together with us in communion. So let's pray. Dear God, we just come before you today and just uh, we, we are just so thankful for your love and um, just the, the new glories that you have for us every single day. Um, we are just so thankful for that, but also just for the fact that you stay the same in, in, in the way that you love us and that will never change. So we're uh, thankful for that love and just the ways that you continue to go before us. And God, we just uh, ask you to be with us today and keep us uh, safe and healthy. And you are praying. Amen. All right, as we go into our time of offering this week, um, we just want to say uh, thank you for um, those who have just continued continue to faithfully give. Um, we, are we are very appreciative of that because then we are able to uh, continue to, to trust God with um, with with our finances here and to be able to provide these you know online services especially when um, when there are moments when we have to uh, potentially shut down for a time and even uh, early early this year when we did but also later this month for the Christmas Eve and the last uh, service of the month that we're able to to do that and um, yeah so we're just very appreciative of that uh, there are a few different ways you can give there are uh, offering plates at the doors as you leave uh, you can actually go go to uh, the app or online. Um, so you can either go to sardiniacc.com slash give and just give under there and you can uh, set up uh, different scheduled mon monthly payments if you'd like or weekly payments. And it's just a great way to, to keep giving that way. And uh, so, so we're just appreciative of that and just the ways that uh, you are faithfully giving to what God is doing here in our community as well as farther out. So I'm going to go ahead and pray this morning and we'll uh, go into our time of offering. God, uh, we are so, we are so thankful for you, for your love, and um, just the way that uh, you you take what we have, uh, which may sometimes is a little and sometimes a lot, but no matter the amount, God, you are able to take that and multiply it greatly in, in order to um, to just um, further your kingdom. So we are appreciative of that, and just the ways that you continue to go before us in that way. So we praise you for that, and we just thank you for all that you do. In your name, I pray. Amen.
What do you want for Christmas, little boy? <sighs> My mind had gone blank. Frantically, I tried to remember what it was I wanted. I was blowing it, blowing it. Come on, kid. How about a nice uh, football? 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 What's a football? <laughs> Without conscious will, my voice squeaked out. Football. Okay, get him out of here. A football? Oh, no. Okay, what was I doing? Me. Wake up, stupid. Wake up. No. <laughs> You'll shoot your eye out, kid. Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Gotta love Ralphie, right? <laughs> Show of hands, anybody had a Red Rider BB gun growing up or got that for Christmas? All right, yeah, all right. We got a few of you out there. I love it. I love it. Well, hey, you know, in 1978, uh, the American Journal of Orthopsychiatry published a study that was on, done on the percentage of children who believe in Santa Claus. And they discovered that an overwhelming 85% of children believe in him. And my question is, who are the other 15% bringing that number down? Come on, y'all. Now, what is so surprising uh, about this research, what makes it so interesting is not the percentage and the numbers, uh, but that over the years, studies show that the percentages have virtually remained the same. Just a couple years ago, CNN published an article citing that today, the numbers still hover around 85%. 85% of American children still believe in Santa, and that's awesome. Uh, in the United Kingdom, the number is even higher. But... While belief in Santa uh, has remained the same over the last 40 years or so, the belief in God has not fared quite as well. Uh, when Gallup first introduced a, a poll question about belief in God or a higher power in the mid-70s, nearly everyone surveyed said that they did. They did believe in a God or some kind of higher power. But now, according to research, uh, the numbers have actually dropped significantly. The number of those in America who do not believe in God climbed from 22% in 2007 to 33% in 2014. Only 66% of Protestants and 64% of Catholics say they are absolutely certain that God exists, which is just, that's mind-blowing to me. 66% <laughs> of church people only 66% say that they're absolutely certain God exists. Uh, that's both, the, both of those are down eight percentage points, respectively, in that 2007-2014 time frame. That's a percentage point per year. So with over 300 million Americans, the amount of people uh, abandoning belief in God is simply staggering. And so the question is, what do these have to do with each other? Belief in God, belief in Santa... Well, I believe that there's a correlation between the two. You see, what's happening in our culture and in our churches today is that we've blended what we believe about Santa and what we believe about God to the point that many are confusing the two. In other words, what many people believe about Santa has also come to be true of what they believe about God. And if we're not careful, we can tend to view our relationship with God the same way that we, review, that we view our relationship with Santa. Because whether or not you realize it, uh, many of us were taught at a, at a young age some things about God that when you break it down sound a whole lot more like Santa Claus. How many of you were told that, that God will only love you and bless you if you are a good little boy or a good little girl? And maybe you grew up with a version of God that was kind of this old guy with a long white beard that uh, he was only there to answer your every wish and request. Or maybe for some of you, God was someone that you only talked about or thought about uh, maybe one time a year. Ironically, it was around Christmas time. 
But as you got older, some of those things you were told about God didn't quite pan out the way you had thought they should. Like, like you tried to be good, but you didn't really feel loved. Or, or you asked and asked and asked God for something, but he didn't give it to you. Or maybe you wanted God to show up in a certain situation, a certain time in your life, but you feel like he was nowhere to be found. And so when those beliefs about God didn't line up with your experience, when that relationship didn't play out the way you expected it to, you started to have some doubts. Maybe you, uh, maybe you questioned God, you became angry, and, and as is the case for more and more people today, you just kind of quit believing. Maybe you still believe that some sort of God exists, but, but you're not too sure about who he is. And so we designed this series to set the record straight. And so for the next few weeks leading up to Christmas, whether you worship here in person or whether you're worshiping uh, with us today online from home, uh, we are going to be talking about uh, some of the common ways that people tend to view God more like Santa Claus, and we're going to explore what Scripture tells us about who our Heavenly Father really is. And so today we're going to look at the first way that people tend to view God like Santa. Now, um, when a child hears the name Santa Claus, what's the first thing that they tend to think about or associate with him? Presents, that's right. When my kids hear Santa, they immediately start formulating their Christmas list. You know what I'm talking about? Now, it's one thing for us to do this when we hear the name Santa, but so many today have the same view when it comes to God. You see, God is the guy whose primary purpose, his primary function is to hear and answer my wish list. And why wouldn't he? When many of us grew up hearing scripture verses thrown around like, like these, like try the one in Matthew chapter 7. Hey, ask and it will be given to you for everyone who asks, receives. All right, or John 14, 14. Jesus said, you may ask for anything in my name and I will do it. Well, thanks, Jesus. Hey, it makes it sound like all I need to do uh, is throw on an in Jesus name at the end of whatever I'm asking for, at the end of my request, and he'll turn into this magic genie who will just grant me unlimited wishes. Right? Like, hey, God, for Christmas this year, I'd like one of those new uh, luxury cars in my driveway with the bow on it, like in commercials, in Jesus' name. <laughs> right? God, please let me pick the winning lottery numbers this week, in Jesus' name, of course. I mean, hey, if Jesus says he'll do it, then why not ask? Want that new job? In Jesus' name, poof, your boss overlooks every other candidate, and it's yours. All right, want that girl to say yes when you ask her out? Kapow, in Jesus' name, she's your girlfriend. Want the Bengals to win the Super Bowl? <laughs> All right, now, that's kind of a stretch. Even God is probably like, hey, come on, let's be reasonable here, okay? <laughs> I had to. <clears throat> Here, here's the problem with this approach to, to these kinds of verses, though. Uh, the first is that it takes these uh, scriptures widely out of context. When Jesus says, ask and it will be given, or, or ask and he'll do it, he's talking about asking for things that are in line with God's will. In John, Jesus is talking about doing things in us and through us, things that he himself modeled to us on earth. His desire is for us to ask him uh, to produce in us the same kind of fruit and Christ-like character uh, that he modeled, not for material blessings or financial gain. Here's what James, the brother of Jesus, says uh, as he's talking about um, when he's teaching about asking God, when he's taking it out of context. In chapter 4 of his letter, he says, You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You see, God isn't, isn't going to give us uh, what we ask for. 
if it's out of line with, with his will. He's not going to uh, give in to our request if it involves something that's harmful to ourselves or someone else. Even if it's in the form of a prayer request with a, a in Jesus' name on the end of it. Listen to what one commentator says about this. He says, To use God to obtain what one, what one wants is an idolatrous form of prayer. It's the prayer of a pagan who believes the magic word will force the gods to do his bidding. When one prays for what brings pleasure without regard for the desires of others or for the will of God, he asks wrongly and should not expect an answer. Maybe that's why when Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, he warned us not to babble like the pagans. And he says it's because your heavenly Father already knows what you're going to ask him before you even say it. Now, Santa doesn't know what you want ahead of time. That's why we have to make lists for Santa. That's why we have to go and tell him. But thank God he's not Santa. And he doesn't want us to to treat him or to relate to him in the same way. And that's the other problem with using verses like these to treat God like a big Santa Claus. Uh, It's devoid of the relationship that God wants with us. God wants to be much more than our, uh, our sugar daddy. You see, he is our heavenly father, and he wants to treat us like any good father would treat his children. In fact, that's the context that Jesus is using here in Matthew when he says, ask and it'll be given. He's trying to emphasize how God responds to those who passionately seek his presence, to those who approach him as they would a father. Jesus' words here come right after his teaching on prayer in Matthew 6. This is where we uh, find his model for prayer. It's also known as the Lord's Prayer. This is how Jesus tells us to ask God for something. Matthew 6, 6, he says, uh, but when you, when you pray, go into your room and close the door and pray to your, what? Father. He says we should approach God like a father. You see, that's the relationship, that's the basis for our asking God something. It's that he's, he's our father. Now, anytime I am brave enough or bold enough to take my children with me to the grocery store, (laughs) you know what I'm talking about, I always have one bargaining chip in my back pocket to use to to ensure my sanity and to guarantee that we all get out of there alive. Anybody care to guess what that is? Well, it's, it's this. If you behave we can go look down the toy aisle. Anyone ever used that one before? Most of the time, this, this works. Uh, but my kids also know that every time I do this, almost every time at least, they know I'm always going to say, all right, guys, we can look at the toys, but we're not going to buy any toys today. They know I'm going to say that every time. And every time they still ask, Dad, will you buy me this toy? Now, None of that is unusual. None of that is strange. A lot of you have had similar experiences with, with your own kids. Um, why is it not strange? Well, it's because I'm their dad, and they're my kids. They have no problem asking me for something. What would be weird if is, is if like a random guy walked up to me or maybe a, a, an employee at the store and asked me to buy him a toy. Now, that would, that would be kind of weird. Why would that be weird? Because we don't have that uh, relationship. <laughs> but kids have no problem asking their parents for something because that relationship is what paves the way for their asking in the first place. They have access to me, not because of anything they've done, certainly not because they have money to buy their own toys, uh, but because they're my children. And the same is true for you and I. We have access to our Heavenly Father, we have access to God because we are his children. And he has no problem with us asking, but we have to understand what it is he wants us to ask for. So let's look at at Jesus' prayer, what he asks in in that model prayer he gave us in Matthew chapter 6. He says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, 
and forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, does this sound like uh, does this sound like a prayer of manipulation? Is Jesus asking uh, God, "Give me, give me, give me, give me"? God, can you just help me out? Can you help me pass this test? Can you help me do well on this project? Can you build up my four hundred one k? Can you just grant me a bonus this year uh, at work so I can buy a shiny new toy for myself? God, can you just make this person like me? God, can you make that person just please go away? It's not what Jesus prays for. No, he asks for God's will to be done. He asks for uh, the ability to forgive others as God has forgiven us. And he says, oh, please provide me for what I need, not what I want, what I need just for today. You see, Jesus wants us to approach God as children rather than treating God like Santa. Now, here's where I want to camp out for the rest of our time the last few minutes today. I I, I don't think... um, I don't think Jesus wanted to emphasize what we should ask for from God as much as he wants us to be confident in what we've already received from God. See, our focus should be on, our focus should be on what we have, not what we're asking for. Okay, here's, here's the thing. If I'm at the grocery store with my kids, that's a big if, But if I'm at the grocery store with my kids, uh, most likely at some point, one of my kids, probably my four-year-old little boy, he's going to ask me for a toy, dinosaur, race car, because that's what he wants. And and as his dad, I may or or may not um, give that to him, depending on if I believe that's what he really needs at that time. But you know what my little boy has never had to ask me for? My son has never had to ask me if I will give him love. Never had to ask me that. He's never had to ask if I consider him my child or if I consider him my joy. He's never had to ask me uh, if I want him or if there's anything I wouldn't do to assure his safety and well-being He's never had to ask me to do everything in my power to provide him food when he's hungry or a bed to sleep in or medicine when he's sick. He's never had to ask for a seat at our table or if he can be a member of our family. Now, why hasn't he had to ask me for those things? Because he's my son. And he already has those things. He already has all of that. And those things will never change. The Apostle Paul wrote a a letter to a church in a city called Ephesus, and at the beginning of his letter, he reminds the believers there what God has done for them and all the things that they have in Christ. So what I'd like to do just for the next uh, moment, I was was challenged uh, a while back to quit talking so much when I preach and just let God's Word do the speaking. So I'm just going to read this passage here. It's about uh, 12 verses And I want you to pay close attention to all the things that that Paul says already belong to us. We already have these things because we are in Christ. So it's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. 
In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Paul lists a lot there. First thing he says in verse 3 is that God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual gift in Christ. Everything. In Christ we have everything. You know, I remember when my younger brother and I, when we were growing up, uh, we used to go visit the Santa at the mall and uh, tell him our, our Christmas list. And I can remember the first year my brother was old enough to vocalize what he wanted for Christmas. And he sat up in that Santa's lap. And the first thing he said when Santa said, what would you like for Christmas this year? He said, everything. <laughs> now, now, Santa can't do that. I mean, he's good, but he can't do that. He can't give you everything. But the Apostle Paul says here that in Christ, we already have everything. God gave us everything when we were baptized into Christ through faith. Every good gift that God can think of to give his children, he's already given to you. And then Paul goes on to list all those blessings. These are uh, 12 verses, um, uh, right here in Ephesians, these were originally all one long sentence in the original language. So you can almost see like Paul running out of breath, trying to list all these things as if he were singing like all, all the verses of the 12 days of Christmas continuously. And so Paul says, here's what our God, here's what our true love has already given us this Christmas. So verse four, he says, you are chosen. God chose you. His desire is for you to be his child, pure and blameless. Verse 5, he says, you are adopted. God's will before the world began. His predetermination was that you would become his child and have all the rights and privileges thereof. Verse 6, he says, we have grace. He says, God gave you the opposite of what you deserved on the cross. Verse 7, he says, we're redeemed. God bought us. We were owned by sin, we were slaves to sin, and God bought us uh, through Jesus' blood. He bought us back from that bondage. Verse 7, he says, you also have forgiveness. God doesn't hold your sins against you anymore. When you ask him for something, he doesn't say, ah, ah, remember what you did last week? Why don't you come back after you haven't done that for a while? Why don't you come back after you've gotten yourself uh, straightened out? God doesn't do that. Verse 9, he says, we have the secret of God's will. There's no, more, uh, there's no more mystery. There's no more guessing what God wants. In Christ, we can know what God wants. We can know his will, and therefore we can know what to say when we ask him for something. Uh, he gives us the wisdom and the understanding to know what to ask for. Uh, verse 13, he says, you are included. You have been included in God's family. There's no, uh, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not pretty enough, uh, you don't make the cut, you don't have enough money or achievements or talent. Uh, there's no wrong hair, no wrong last name, no wrong school, no wrong side of the tracks. In Christ, you have been included into the family of God. Verse 13, he also says that we have the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit literally lives inside of you, giving you access to the same power that Jesus has. In verse 14, he says, you have an inheritance. Now, who receives an inheritance? Who receives an, who gets an inheritance? Someone's children, right? You see, God's children are promised an inheritance. And God is not the kind of father who's going to write his kids out of the will. In fact, Paul says that the Holy Spirit serves as a deposit on our inheritance, that word there means like a, a down payment, earnest money. It's a full security that what is promised or pledged will be delivered. In the modern Greek, 
uh, the word for deposits, arabon, that word is the same word that's also used today for engagement ring. So it's all my, all my single ladies, dating ladies out there asking Santa baby to bring you a ring this year. Rest assured, God has already done that for you. He's already given it to his bride, the church. And so as we... Uh, As we wrap up today, I just want to invite you to take a moment to be real with your Heavenly Father this morning. You know, maybe maybe you realize that you've been doing a lot of asking of God lately. And you realize that when you do that, you're treating Him more like uh, more like Father Christmas than your Heavenly Father. And so now is your time to to make that relationship right. Maybe in the last few moments you you realized, um, man, I've I've spent so much time this year, it's been such a tough year, focusing on what I don't have rather than what I do have. And God's word has reminded us of all the things that we have already because we are in Christ. Christ. And so maybe for you, as we move into this time of invitation, you just need to, to spend a moment thanking God. And if you're here today and, and you don't have that confidence that comes from being a child of God, man, then we, we invite you to become one today. By putting Jesus in charge of your life, by following Him, you have access to your Heavenly Father. You see, it's, it's only because of Jesus that we can approach the throne of the God of the universe just like a little child would walk up to Santa. God wants us to, to come to him in faith. That's the kind of relationship that God calls us to. So in just a moment, we're going to stand, we're going to sing after I pray, and I um, just want to invite you. to treat God a little less like Santa this morning and a little bit more like a heavenly father who loves to give good gifts to his children and who has already given them everything in Christ. Let's pray. God, forgive us. Forgive us when we treat you like Santa. God, forgive us when... um, when we allow some of those same beliefs to permeate our relationship with you. God, forgive us when we ask for something and then we get angry because we don't feel like you, you answered our request the way that we wanted to. Because the truth is, is that you are a good, good father. And if there's something that you don't give us that we feel like we need or we want. You, you didn't give it to us for a reason. And that reason was love. So help us to realize that. God, and even more importantly, help us to realize today all the things that we already have <laughs> because Jesus endured the cross. Because of his sacrifice. Because of his love. We have access to you. We have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Anything that we could think of, God, we already have because of Jesus. And we're grateful for that today. God, we love you. We worship you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we serve an awesome, great God. Uh, I am thankful that we are going to be talking all month about how awesome our God is, how he is nothing uh, like Santa Claus, how he is so much better than Santa. And we invite you uh, to join us back, whether it's in person or online, uh, for the rest of the month. Just remember a few things um, as we... Uh, conclude and dismiss today uh, our Christmas Eve service on the 24th and the Sunday following uh, Christmas the 27th. We will be online only, so if you show up, 
nobody will be here. You can still, I guess, have, have fun um, outside in the cold because the facility will be locked down. But we invite you to join us online that day, Facebook and YouTube. Uh, check us out for those services. Um, also, remember, members, if you have not voted yet, this is your last chance to do so in person. Uh, ballots are out there at our Welcome Center. You can grab one on the way out. Uh, if you've already requested one by mail, make sure to get those back in this week. Uh, and finally, just please, as you do go to your Heavenly Father and ask Him for things this week, uh, please ask Him to continue to watch over and heal all those in our con congregation that are dealing with the uh, effects of covid uh, we still have many, and um, they need our prayers. And so let's go to our Heavenly Father right now as we dismiss. God, we thank you so much um, that you give us life. <laughs> you put that breath in our lungs, um, but you've also given us eternal life through Jesus. And even though uh, one day that breath in our lungs will leave us here on earth, God, that eternal life, we have that forever. We cling to that. You gave us your spirit to deposit that, that inheritance that we look forward to. Uh, but right now, we, we do lift up our friends um, who are dealing with the effects of illness and, and virus and disease right now. God, we pray that, that you would heal their physical lungs. God, that we, we pray that, um, that your powerful presence would be with them right now and with their families, that you would bring them comfort and peace to know that you are there with them every step of the way. God, may we continue to be an encouragement to them. May you uh, allow us to be your hands and feet to bring hope and to bring peace and comfort uh, to those who are dealing with these trials right now. God, we thank you that we get to do that, that we get to be a part of your church, of your team. And so go with us today, God. Keep us safe until next week. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys.